Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of MMT Mondays. I am Enzo Codella with Real Progressives and I will be your host this week. Last time we went over part one of Randall Ray's speech in which he discussed the destabilizing nature of the private markets and went over the process of financialization that our nation has been going through for the last century or so. A process in which the neoliberal class has turned every logical tenet of our economic system upside down in an effort to enrich themselves and their bodies while condemning our economy to a perpetual boom and bust cycle that honestly has only been getting worse every time. In today's episode, we will go over part two of the speech in which Dr. Ray will walk us through some of the core principles of our economy as it exists today, while also providing some solutions to the problem of financialization that has become so pervasive, not only in talks about the economy, but also the practice that our politicians have enacted. If you've been following our content or even been doing some MMT research of your own, you're more than likely familiar with many of these points, such as the fact that our government is the sole issuer of dollars that there is, making it, by definition, the largest financial institution in our economy and pretty much impossible for it to run out of dollars, let alone create a need for our federal government to borrow dollars from any other institution, domestically or internationally. Knowing this, you've probably figured that public spending is not only much more feasible than the neoliberal class has had us believe, but it's also quite desirable if we are going to regain any semblance of stability in our lives. Now, according to the neoliberal talking heads, this process is unsustainable because multi-trillion dollar spending and the debt and uh, the deficit and scary words. But think about this, like really think about this. When the public sector is in deficit, that means that the private sector, you and I and the market in general, has extra assets. When the government has issued the dollars, we received it. It, it has to come back to the balance of it all. It has to be balanced. And that is the point that Dr. Ray is going to be making in this video. So keep that in mind every time you hear people trying to make a case for the government to work as a business, to try to make a surplus and reduce its spending. Because when the government is reducing its spending, we are the ones who end up with fewer assets. And when the government increases its spending, we are the ones who receive that money. Additionally, Dr. Ray speaks of the banking sector and debunks this myth that it operates like any other privately owned industry, when in reality, they're more akin to a public-private partnership which uses government-issued currency to make their payments. The focus of Ray's argument here is that neoliberalism has prioritized the deregulation and the unconditional backstopping of the big banks, something you surely remember from the 2008 financial crisis, in which not only did they not suffer any consequences from their absolutely reckless actions, but in many cases actually got rewarded for them, which I don't think it takes a psychologist to figure out that's, that's not how you stop this behavior anytime soon. Lastly, Dr. Ray finishes his speech by listing some measures that, in his assessment, can harness the power of the financial system in a way that is constructive, not to the top 1%, but to the rest of us, the people who actually work and make up this economy. And then he will move on to answer some questions from the audience. So, with all this in mind, let's head right into the speech, and I'll see you back here from the other side. All right, what do we need to do? We need a, a new paradigm. Okay, so the textbooks in the old days, you would get to about chapter seven of the macro textbook before they use the word government. Okay, now they don't do it at all because the macro books are all based on a single representative agent who's maximizing utility through time. There is no government anymore. Okay. So instead, what we need to do is introduce the government on page one. 
The government is by far the largest economic entity in the economy, by far. Uh, the United States government is the biggest purchaser in the world, by far. And furthermore, the monetary system is the government's monetary system, almost without exception around the world today, and as far back as you go in time, back to Babylonia, the monetary system has always been used by the authorities, created by the authorities and used by the authorities. What do they use it for? To create and mobilize resources. You hope in the public interest. Okay? Uh, and occasionally, it probably is. Second, you have to um, discipline your analysis with balance sheets. When I was Minsky's student, I'd come in to talk to him, you know, he'd listen to me for a couple minutes and say, go back home and discipline it with balance sheets. If you can't write out the balance sheet, you do not know what you're talking about. Virtually no economist can write a balance sheet okay, for anything, and they definitely can't do it for the models that they're presenting because there aren't any balance sheets there. Um, so you start out, you know, financial assets equal financial liabilities. As soon as you do that, you think about the, the debt clock that used to be at Times Square. They moved it off the square for some reason. I don't know. Okay, what is that? It's an asset clock. It's telling you how many assets the government is creating. Okay? Um, debts have to equal assets. You need stock flow consistent modeling. I won't go into that. The macro sectoral balances, which is the picture that I showed before. So you can't say stupid things like the Wall Street Journal said in 1999. They said, isn't it great that the government is running a surplus and adding to national saving? Left-hand column. A whole story and the picture. Okay? And then on the right-hand side, a whole story about, isn't it terrible that the private sector isn't saving? Okay? The two are an identity. Right? This is the Wall Street Journal. Okay? So they don't understand sectoral balances. Okay, second, we want to start with a modern money view, so I suppose this will be presented tomorrow. Uh, I'll be very quick. Uh, money is not primarily a medium of exchange. This is the way it's always introduced in economics textbooks. It's not primarily a means of circulation. Money is a state monopoly. It's a unit of account, okay? The dollar is our money of account. Banks make payments for customers in bank IOUs denominated in the state's money of account. So in the United States, it will be the dollar. Contingent monetary claims are orders of magnitude bigger than capital, bigger than safe and liquid assets, bigger than income, and bigger than production. Probably 99% of the financial sector has nothing to do with producing stuff and selling the stuff that was produced and paying income. A revised view of fiscal policy. We have a sovereign issuer of a currency. Sovereign issuer spends by crediting bank accounts and taxes by debiting. Okay? They cannot run out. It's literally impossible for the government to run out of its own currency. Sovereign government cannot borrow its own currency. It's also literally impossible for the U.S. government to borrow dollars. It might be able to borrow euros, okay? but it can't borrow dollars. Bond sales are just part of monetary policy. The sovereign supplies net financial saving. This is what I was getting to, the so-called debt clock. That is really a clock showing the net financial saving that the government has created for us. Fiscal policy dominates. Okay, this is exactly the opposite of what mainstream believes. They think that the Fed is controlling the economy when actually the Fed is more like the Wizard of Oz. The steering wheel is not connected to anything. They think they're doing a lot, but they actually have virtually no influence whatsoever over the economy. And if we abandon the use of fiscal policy, we're abandoning any kind of control over the economy. A revised view of monetary policy. All that the central bank really does is sets the interest rate target, and then they supply reserves. They can't control the money supply. Furthermore, when the Fed decides to raise or lower the interest rate, we don't even know what direction the impact will have. So the Fed raises the interest rate thinking it's stepping on the brake, this is what Warren Mosler always says, when actually it's stepping on the gas. And when the Fed is um, lowering the interest rate, as it did under QE, quantitative easing, 
It thinks that it's stepping on the gas when actually it's stepping on the brake. Okay? QE, for anyone who understood monetary policy, you knew it was going to have no effect on the economy, no positive effect on the economy, maybe a slight negative effect on the economy. Okay? So they don't even know what they're doing uh, when they set the rates. They understand they set the rates, but they don't know what they're doing. Central bank uh, policy is never independent. Okay, there's this great belief that our Fed is independent, and thank goodness that they are. Okay, they are not independent and cannot be independent. I won't, won't go through the details here. A revised view of finance. So the conventional view is based on this loanable funds approach, and that what financial markets do is they take in the savings and then they lend it out. Okay. The reality is that saving don't finance nothing. Okay? We have to reverse this. It is spending that creates the income, some of which can be saved. The spending has to come first. Okay? How is the spending financed? Well, the finance is created simultaneously with the spending because what we have is a system of credits and debits. You can think of what banks do is they keep records for us. Okay. They keep records of the credits and debits. They, the spending is financed by a credit to somebody's bank account. Now, the main justification for freeing the financial system, okay, which we have been doing uh, really, even since the uh, 1960s, it accelerated a bit in the 70s and then full board deregulation from the 80s through uh, Clinton. The argument always was, we need more finance. We need to free them so that they can supply more finance. What we freed them to do was to financialize the economy, not to provide finance to productive activities. Financialization is not finance, it's leveraging and layering of debt on debt on debt. So all of these things that we have now, we're not about increasing finance of productive activities, including uh, building and owning homes, okay? As Warren Moser points out, with those old Jimmy Stewart thrifts, we built and sold and financed more homes in 1974 than we did in the 2000s with the securitization uh, boom. All of these things. Uh, I include Obamacare as financialization of the health care system, continued financialization. Okay, in any case, finance is not a scarce resource. All it is is keystrokes. As long as you have somebody with a finger that can keystroke, you can create finance. Okay. Finance is not scarce. Good borrowers are scarce. Good borrowers are the kind that can pay it back, right? Those are hard to find. Finance is infinite. Good borrowers are very finite. And what banks used to do is try to find the good borrowers. They don't do that anymore. Okay, why? Because they don't hold the loans anymore. They package them together and sell them to dupes. Okay, that's the whole idea. Your pension fund is a good example of the dope that they're trying to sell the stuff to. Okay, Minsky always said he had a, a Wall Street view. That didn't mean he was pro-Wall Street. It just meant that he looked at it from the point of view of what Wall Street does. The vast majority of monetary transactions have little to do with circulating or producing output. And so... The typical models that economists start with, okay, in which the financial system and money are all about financing transactions in goods and services, is just false. It's going to take you to the wrong place. Many, uh, much of the finance that's being created is to finance positions in assets, which is... Uh, Spending some money now, hoping to get more money later. Or exchanging the characteristics of income and outgo streams. So this is where we get all sorts of derivatives and swaps. And then many are hedges or bets on 
contingent outcomes, so that's like credit default swaps, where you're betting that somebody's going to die. And if they die, you get paid. Okay. What do banks do? Banks are not money lenders. Minsky always said, if you want to find a money lender, you go to the street corner in Chicago, and the guy has a trench coat, and he's got uh, dollar bills in his pockets. Okay? And you borrow from him. That's a money lender. You don't pay him back. He breaks your legs. Banks aren't money lenders. They don't have any money there. Okay? They're not intermediaries between savers and investors. Instead, what do they do? They accept IOUs. And then they make payments for their customers using their own IOUs. Most of that time, that means they pay other banks, that is, whoever it is that you're paying. Um, or they make payments to the government using the government's own IOUs, technically bank reserves. These are facilitated by the central bank. So think of banks as making payments rather than accepting savings deposits and then lending them out. Now, we also have to look at banks as being public-private partners. There's no such thing as a private bank. Okay? Cannot exist. They have to be public-private partners. Two reasons. Okay? One, we need par clearing. The U.S. tried banking without par clearing, which means that when you got a bank note from Bank A, you never knew at what uh, rate Bank B would accept it. Okay, So to have par clearing, we need a central bank. If the central bank is going to do par clearing, they have to lend reserves. They have to stand by to always lend reserves to the banks that are suffering a clearing drain. The second reason why we can't have private banks is because Banks are taking positions in assets, and there's some risk involved in that. We can't let depositors lose their deposits because it causes bank runs. And so to stop bank runs, we also created deposit insurance. So if you have the central bank acting as a lender of last resort, and the treasury acting as an insurer of deposits, okay, there's no such thing as a private bank. The government is backstopping them. If the government is going to backstop them, markets will not work to discipline them, even if they could in a very imaginary world. They will not do it if the government is backstopping them. So the other side of the coin of the government backstop is the government must regulate them, okay? which is what the government has not been doing very well uh, for quite a while. Furthermore, if you want to try to get the banks to make good loans, that is, find those few good borrowers, you have to make them hold the loans to maturity. Otherwise, they have no incentive to do good, what we call underwriting. So what we need to do is try to return to relationship banking and moving away from markets to supply finance. Again, finance is not a scarce resource. All the arguments about why we needed to free the banks doesn't hold up unless it is a scarce resource. And Matt said some good things about this idea of scarcity. Okay, to conclude, what do we need to do? We need to reform the financial system to promote the capital development of the economy. And Minsky identified five basic elements that need to be provided by your financial system. The first is you need a safe and sound payment system. Okay, safe and sound payment system. This is what we had after adopting deposit insurance and creating the Fed in 1913. We had a safe and sound payment system. And note that even though we just went through the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression, there were no runs on U.S. banks. Why is that? The government safety net. Okay? No one had any cause to run on an American bank. You know, they did have a run on Northern Rock in the U.K. Why? 
because the UK offered only 90% insurance of your deposits. Is any rational person going to leave deposits in a bank if they're only 90% covered? Of course not. You run. So in the United States, we effectively had 100% um, insurance for smaller deposits. And then when necessary, we raised the limit. So the safe and sound payment system. Now, uh, I, I say at the bottom, there's no reason why all these things need to be consolidated, no reason why they need to be provided by the private banks. An alternative to using the commercial banks and the thrifts to provide a safe and sound payment system is to use postal savings banks, which we had in the United States and which some countries still use. Okay? A postal savings bank is a, is a government-run safe and sound payment system. Okay? And we might think about, well, if banks really don't want to supply the payment system, Let's go back to a postal savings bank. So that could be a, a, a good alternative. Second, short-term loans to households and firms and possibly to state and local government. This is, again, what commercial banks uh, used to do. Um, and we can think of uh, some kinds of loans, like student loans. Okay? Student loans, maybe it makes more sense to provide these directly through government loans rather than using the private banks to provide that kind of um, loan. Just in general, the way that you evaluate whether it should be the government doing it or a somewhat private bank doing it is to ask the question, how important is the underwriting and how complicated is the underwriting? If underwriting is extremely important and it's difficult to do, perhaps the private banks can do it better than the government can do it. On the other hand, if the underwriting isn't so important and if there is a big public purpose in promoting the activity, like going to college, the underwriting doesn't matter that much. So what if 10% of the students default? Okay, Maybe you want to do it through government loans. Uh, on uh, housing, maybe housing also is a public good. Okay? And maybe we can tolerate a higher default rate. Then, again, the government ought to provide the loans directly rather than going through the um, banking system. Safe and sound housing finance system. We had that. Jimmy Stewart thrifts. Safe and sound. Homeowners virtually never defaulted, and the thrifts never failed until we freed them in 1974 and said, you don't have to be Jimmy Stewart kind of thrifts anymore. You can be bought by real estate developers and eventually drug runners and CIA-funded groups. Okay? And then, of course, they failed. All right, so we could go back, or again, we might decide just to do it directly through the government. A range of financial services, including insurance, brokerage, retirement savings, services, and so on. Typically, these were investment bank um, kinds of uh, services. And finally, long-term funding of positions in expensive capital assets. Again, this was investment banking um, kinds of services. Um, however, there's no uh, reason why all these things need to be consolidated in a particular institution. Okay, I'll stop I'm, if we still have time. I'm glad to take questions. Okay.
Well, so uh, many of my friends support transactions taxes. So you, uh, Tobin tax, financial transactions taxes, to slow things down. Okay, so if you have if you have to pay, they claim very low percentages, so well below one percent uh, transaction t- tax every time uh, you sell an asset then that will slow things down. Okay, and this probably is true and probably would help a little bit. So we have computerized trading, which uh, I think even pretty mainstream people are starting to recognize as being a problem. Um, So that's sort of a conventional way to slow that down and make things a little more stable. Uh, I would, without saying we shouldn't do that, I would take a different approach. So Eric Tamoyne, uh, who's written a lot on this and was one of our students, um, proposed that we should treat financial innovations just like drug innovations. Okay? Uh, most of them are a bad idea. Okay? Dangerous, deadly, kill the patients, and so they have to be approved before you can use them. Okay, so it takes a very long process and expensive to get new drugs approved, and that probably is a good thing. Financial innovations, okay, you don't have to get any approval at all. So uh, you go ahead and you start trying them, and they turn out to be deadly and dangerous, and then maybe they'll be outlawed. Okay, maybe, right? Although everything, virtually everything that was done to cause the global financial crisis is starting to be done again, okay? Um, so I think that this is a good idea. Say, so, okay, fine, you guys innovate, but it has to be approved before you can do it. So I think that that would um, uh, at least put a bit of a barrier uh, between the innovation and immediately starting to do it. Okay, uh, I think it, it also would be nice if uh, the government wasn't so ready to bail out the institutions that make mistakes. Uh, I I think that all of the big banks should have been shut down and resolved, and. Uh, you know, not only does that um, prevent them from continuing to cause problems, which they will do, uh, troubled banks generally get more troubled when you intervene and help them. But also, it sends a message, right? Uh, and we didn't do that at all. So I think that that also is important. Scott was going to say something. Oh, you weren't. <laughs> Stretching. Oh, you were. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So I I should be more specific. So I'm talking about particular kinds of institutions. Okay. And so if you and he want to engage in some kind of crazy uh, scheme uh, and you're both willing to put your names on it, I'm much less willing to, to say that we ought to intervene in that. So we have protected financial institutions, okay, commercial banks, and I'm talking about what we allow them to do, okay? Which I, I know that it's become very complicated because... Uh, a huge part of the financial system is uh, not in those categories. However, the, the big commercial banks are all linked to all of these institutions engaging in this stuff. So we need to cut that link and then regulate the commercial banks, keep them separate. 
someone back there. Hi, Professor Ray. Uh, so I'm a, a lawyer, and my practice is mostly around small businesses and startup firms. And in Ohio, we, we have a pretty good infrastructure as far as trying to uh, mentor entrepreneurs in these things with this third frontier program, and they have this innovation fund. But as it turns out, as you point out, a lot of this, they're not ready to fund these entrepreneurs. They, they tell these guys, you know, you've got a great idea, you've got a great product, software, we don't really have a, a, a company. And so it comes down to, like you said, they even have a phrase for it, friends, family, and fools. So people who do get funding for their capital expenditures are basically, they're betting on an idea that they think is good. And so, but the fact is, is as you point out, a lot of these guys maybe aren't credit worthy borrowers because a lot of these startup firms will fail, but it may be a public good to have a lot of these companies start, they're buying properties, they're buying, cap making capital expenditures and this sort of thing. So what I'm wondering is how could a state like Ohio, which wants to try to fund this in innovation, create the type of loans for these sorts of endeavors? Yeah, so in this project, Mariana and I always had attention because this is exactly what she's interested in promoting and getting the state involved in this stuff and also pressuring financial institutions to play a bigger role. And when I look at financial institutions like commercial banks, I say, but hold a second, I'm not sure I want commercial banks to get involved in this because it is too risky. So you can get, um, uh, you know, the fools, but also the angels who are willing to, to put money in and win two times out of 100. And that's fine, right? Uh, venture capitalists can become extremely rich on two, in two cases out of 100. Commercial banks cannot live that way, okay? They've got to make it 98 times out of 100. So I don't think we want our protected financial institutions to get involved in that. And, and we definitely need to create more alternatives to providing that very risky kind of funding in the early stages. So I would just suggest you look more at Mariana's other work because she's written a lot in this area. Okay, a bunch. Luis, I was looking at the five points that you highlighted in the last slide. Also applies for international financial For example, the IMF or the World Bank. So the IMF and the World Bank have been criticized in many areas because they have been responsible for Okay, first I thought you were, talk, you were talking about international banking, and so I was just going to quote Keynes. Nothing is more certain that, that banking should be domestic, national, okay? And uh, I'm, I'm biased toward that view, I have to say, that... Uh, you know, there's, there's arguments that, well, if we don't do such and such and such, U.S. banks are going to lose all that kind of business to London. I say, good. <laughs> Let them have it. Okay, we shouldn't uh, be pushing our banks to get involved in competing with the, the London banks. Um, on the, the IMF and, and World Bank, I, it's just not an area I know much about. I, I'm... Uh, critical but uninformed. So there, there's just not much that I can say. It seems to me that most of what they do is probably not very helpful at all. Uh, poor developing countries do not need loans. They need aid. Okay? And so getting a highly indebted country into more debt is just crazy. And, and Greece now of course, is, is exactly in that situation. They don't need loans. Okay? They need debt relief. So I just can't say any more than that. I saw two hands, and I think both of those who saw it, and people called me or something. 
Just to follow uh, Louis' question, um, one interesting thing is how, uh, when we know the side of the financialization, it's involved in national economy, but at least for the international finance. So let's say in the US, how we would start financialization from the telling of the public policy? How we can do that? Uh, awesome. Well, again, part of the problem was that we let commercial banks create all sorts of subsidiaries that did things we didn't want the commercial banks to do, okay? And, you know, this should just be illegal. They shouldn't be allowed to have anything off their balance sheet. Anything they do should be on their balance sheets um, so that we can see it and so that, you know, they're not in running around uh, the capital requirements. I'm... Like Minsky, I'm not a huge fan of just raising capital requirements and thinking you're going to do much uh, because you can actually make the banks more risky by doing that. But you definitely, once you've got them in place, you don't want banks to be able to get around them by putting stuff off their balance sheets. And they've been doing this for a long time. It wasn't something they invented in the 2000s. Uh, I wrote my dissertation in the mid-'80s, and I have a whole section on off-balance sheet operations of the commercial banks. So they have been getting away with it for a long time. And it's very clear why they were doing it, is to get around the rules and regulations. Okay, so this should be illegal. Everything should be on the balance sheet, out in the open, transparent. So th that is one way, because uh, a lot of people think we have the shadow banks and then we have the real banks. But the shadow banks are financed by the real banks, right? And without the real banks, they couldn't do what they were, had been doing. So they really needed that. So if we cut that link and say, no, you can't finance shadow banks, we wouldn't have had half the problems that we had with the shadow banks. Uh, my question is around, uh, you study the history of human behavior, uh, in essence, by seeing these pricing, and it's an intersection of self-interest and group Pricing seemed to be caught up with self-interest overwhelmed. So one of the words that we could use to summarize all this is accountability, how to bring accountability. Uh, the block that type of self-interest and group interest, how to bring the accountability of a penalty for your behavior. So like Volkswagen uh, cannot sue a company in Germany, which is just good people. So somebody will be going to jail uh, for Volkswagen. Yeah. Well, I, I think you've got it. You, you had to throw a lot of people in prison, a lot. The savings and loan crisis was, rel was small relative to this crisis, okay? Uh, and a 1,000 went to prison. So this time it should have been a lot more than that, all right? And we didn't go after anyone. So no one was held accountable. And this... Why, why will we not go after the first Well, because this was the Obama administration's policy set by Holder. Okay, this was Holder's policy. We will not go after. Why? Because it'll damage the reputation of these firms. He said this in public, okay? It'll damage the reputation of, say, Bank of America, okay? which is a criminal enterprise, right? It, it is, okay? It's admitted to fraud after fraud after fraud, and they're still engaging in fraud, okay? But we will not do anything that will damage their reputation, as if it could be damaged more than it already is, you know? So it's just... It's ridiculous. And, and I, I, I really do think they're waiting for the statute of limitations to run out. Because now they are starting to go after a few. Citizens file a lawsuit against the government for doing excessive reasons. We have a lawyer type here. <laughs> Just 
just because, you know, fraud after fraud after fraud. But wouldn't you agree that fraud exacerbates the crisis, but eliminating fraud alone would not eliminate the crisis because, as you've, you've explained, Minsky thought that the crisis was endogenous to capitalism, not because of bad people in those good working institutions. Okay, so, you know, first, there's always some fraud, okay? Uh, but what happens in these bubbles is that you create conditions in which fraud really pays off and pays big. And so the incentives to do it get much bigger, and then you blow the thing up bigger so the fall is much worse. So I agree with that. Um, you, I think, so this is just speculation, because fraud occurred in all the ones, all the ones I listed, right? Massive frauds occurred. I think you can still get the boom and crash, even with no fraud. Okay, and that was definitely Minsky's position. Although our colleague Bill Black is skeptical of this, he he puts a big weight on fraud, and it's clearly important. It's clearly. If you leave it out of the story, you are missing a huge part of the story of these booms and busts. But I think that what happens is that, you know, all, for all the Minsky reasons, you start getting the um, increased fragility, increased leverage ratios, and then the fraudsters see the profits that they can make, and they're encouraged to do it. Just one follow up on that question. The follow up is uh, it seems in addition to all the people who are saying as well as the Department of Justice, there are also other regulatory institutions that there is a political element in their project. It is a process that is there, they have their own market mechanism. So it seems to me that there's another part of that story, which is a sort of either a timidity or a lack of vision of a breakdown in of the degree of the ability to see a big picture uh, and to have the the institutional capacity to regulate uh, this kind of effects on, on the side of the world. Uh, but the question I would ask you, the question I have to make something exploring the wheelhouse is about the bank and tax this idea of the world is just where you see the, the need for you know, nations to, to have the financial uh, domestic accounts settling in that international level in terms of regulation or the yeah, well, on the, the first one, um, uh, oh, I had a response. I lost it with the question. <laughs> um, the, I think there has been deterioration uh, in the various uh, offices that are supposed to supervise. Um, so the SEC, we've seen it there too. Uh, and then just a tremendous revolving door so that uh, it's not just that the um, public stewards see they're going to get a job at the end uh, on Wall Street, but, you know, they're, they're running around with the same people. And these are their friends, and they trust them and uh, can't, see them as criminals. So I think that this is a huge problem. Uh, w when uh, the Fed's um, transcripts were first released, you know, I, I read those, and, and now I've read some uh, surrounding the crisis period. And, uh, you know, on the one hand, there's no conspiracy obvious there, right? But there definitely is concern for the institutions and the individuals in those institutions uh, and trust in those people, right? And so I think that there is this culture, and that is a big problem. So the, the people who are supposed to be regulating do not see them as adversaries.
And they should. Okay, they shouldn't trust them at all. Um, on the, the second part, I, I think the, the Basel agreements are, they've gone in the wrong direction. Right? And so, uh, you know, trying to use agreements that are coming out of this group to regulate your domestic system is a huge problem. All of the, I, I wrote on the Basel II 10 years ago or whenever it was, uh, and it was very clear what what they were setting up, you know, a, a system of self-regulation and great trust in the credit ratings agencies, which now we know where that went. Um, so I'm pretty skeptical of that group on the the um, uh, necessity of the uh, international clearing. I'm I don't know. I don't have an opinion. Don't know enough about it. Hello again. What do you think about all that? Remember to leave your comments, questions, impressions, all that down there in the comment section. More than anything, I believe at least, we have got to remember that the instability of our economy that is left to the whim of the market, that's a political choice. Every time that our government denies us the things that we need, it's not a matter of feasibility or if they have the money or how are you going to pay for it. That's, they, they got all that figured out. And when they don't do it, that is a choice that they make every time they meet and decide not to serve us because they're too busy serving their own donors. And it is our responsibility as a well-educated populace to put pressure on them and demand that they serve us, which is the point. We have the money, we have the resources, we have the structure. All we need is the political will. Remember that, always remember that. If you found this video valuable, don't forget to like, subscribe if you wanna continue getting our content, and share it so that other people can learn from this as well. That's pretty much all that I have for you today. You've been great. So I hope I'll see you back here next time. Y'all take care, okay?